Hello everyone! Welcome back to the RationalVestor.com's Weekend of Frivolity. This is our broiler chicken show. Buck, buck, buck! Um, it is uh, Sunday. It's about 11 o'clock. I'm fired up a little bit later. Yeah, let's see. Are we buck, buck, buck! Yeah, um, like we're live. That's encouraging. It is uh, Sunday. Hey, Oliveri, gotta remember to throw yourself on mute there, Slick. Or else uh, we're gonna blow everything up here. If anybody else uh, in the hangout with me here uh, has their microphone on, probably a good idea to throw yourself on mute. Anyway, looks like uh, we're kicking butt. Um, I think the YouTube page is rocking and rolling. Uh, let's see, uh, just to make sure I'm doing this right. It's been a while since I, uh, I guess, well, I guess last week. Uh, Monday to Friday, we have now Chris um, doing the uh, videos. So uh, he makes it so I don't even have to think. It's a little dangerous. Um, doing the uh, videos. Hey, we're live. Awesome. All right, so uh, happy Sunday morning, everybody. Uh, good evening from Israel. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see. Good morning, Big Bad Brian. <laughs> oh, thanks, Andre. BTC up. Yeah. What up, lady and gents? Yo, yo, yo. Hey, there's Colin. <laughs> I can always recognize Colin. And Rocker! We gotta do the Rocker salute. Rocker. I should go on camera. <laughs> Everybody who's uh, in the uh, hangout will do a Rocker salute. Woo! Rocker! Actually, you can see uh, getting settled into the new digs. And actually, uh, if somebody can tell me what's on the on the uh, dresser there. Uh, be a trivia question for later on. Anyway, turn that off. There's not too many people here in the hangout. Uh, maybe about a half a dozen dozen of us here. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but I uh, didn't eat anything uh, before I got going. Still sort of moving into the new digs. So as a result, I'm actually going to eat a little bit while I uh, do this here with you this morning. Terribly politically incorrect. Um, <laughs> somebody said they won't put me on mute this time. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. All good. Um, so, um, level one program, um, they're kind of winding up right now. Um, so they may come in as they, uh, as they do. I do like to give them the ability to ask me a question, especially, uh, this particular part of the level one program, it's all about eating our vegetables and, um, understanding, you know, sort of the very basic principles of how economies <laughs> are supposed to work. <laughs> Whether they actually do work these days is another thing altogether. This is actually a really good anecdote of um, um, you can actually have to like, we used to joke, uh, you know, with uh, the days of the Cold War, right? You can actually technically have what's called a command economy. You can have a consumer-based economy and you can have a command economy. Uh, I can't remember what the opposite, the word for consumer-based is. Um, uh, and the old analogy is guns versus butter. So uh, in Soviet Russia, they kept the economy going just by building more and more tanks. <laughs> um and then, of course, uh, invading uh, their neighbors and trying to liberate the country's assets and uh, incorporating that into uh, the national treasury. And you keep the Fakazi going that way. Um, hope we don't get into those kind of economies. Dangerous. Uh, we uh, have been, and I suppose it's a hallmark at the end of all of these centuries, that we sort of live through a very consumer-based economy. I think... Uh, the end of the um, the nineteenth century, the beginning of the twentieth century, I think also too that was a very consumer based economy. Think you know stories like the Titanic and stuff. People, you know, sailing across the ocean, very consumer based uh, economy. And then, wow, by nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, and then of course nineteen forties, wow, completely opposite world. 
Uh, everything is like military. Um, and it's interesting too because um, uh, my parents were born and raised through the Great Depression. So they all their childhood memories are about the Great Depression. So it's fascinating how they're very, very old now. Um, in fact, I, um, yeah. Uh, and so their memories of sort of the really shitty times, right? It's sort of like, oh, I remember when I was your age, yeah, same sort of thing. Uh, we're probably going to have to go through that again. Right? And then the, uh, the society will have that sort of benchmark of how bad bad gets. And I think it seems to have to happen sometime around the second or third decade of uh, a new century. Then uh, usually what ends up happening is there's some big shoot 'em up And, of course, we uh, reestablish a new fiat currency basis. And then the whole system sort of resets and the, uh, the banksters uh, use that new currency, whoever wins the next war. Uh, and uh, they just uh, dilute the crap out of that currency over the course of the next 70, 80 years. And we do the whole damn thing all over again. So it's really cool how one thing that I'm noticing personally is I um, have a few people on the site that are very uh, into astrology. And of course, I'm super into uh, cycles. I totally, you know, like everything about our existence is all, everything moves in circles or, uh, you know, a derivative of a circle. So uh, as a result, astrological cycles, uh, you know, six of them all coming together, all here um at the uh at this conjuncture here this uh ten, like five year window <laughs> and all the astrologers i remember before this i had all of the astrologers are like oh god i don't know what's gonna happen this is like once in a million years this shit happens and you can literally see all of the cycles are all resetting themselves all exactly the same time we're going through a sickness cycle that's one uh, we're going. We're definitely going through a money cycle. I mean, the value of the fiat currency system that we've used. Frankly speaking, you know, when I first came into this space, I never thought that they were going to destroy the U.S. dollar the way that they've done. I'm frankly astounded at how they have completely destroyed the U.S. dollar here. I'm absolutely aghast at. I can't believe it. They always say you can't write better fiction than reality. There's no point in predicting the future because you're probably going to be wrong and whatever ends up happening is going to be more outlandish than you could have ever expected. And this is a perfect scenario where uh, if you asked anybody walking down the street of USA America and said, you know, what do you think about the all ID dollar <laughs> or all ID dollar as uh, Homer Simpson would once say. They would have never dreamed what's happened here. I mean, it's shocking. Just last week, they did a $1.2 trillion repo <laughs> in the market. That used to be the whole damn economy, the whole shooting match, the whole thing. There's a, and then it, when we went past a trillion, everybody's like, ooh, the economy's a trillion. They just did one repo, $1.2 trillion <laughs> last week. Yeah, value of money is worthless. Pretty on Wayne. Pretty on Garth. Oh well. Yeah, well, we're gonna look back, and Bitcoin's gonna be a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. Or people are gonna be like, well, somebody should have seen this coming. And all you Satoshi fans are gonna be like, ah, oh, well, we knew it all along. It's uh, a little scary, though, because now I see that the public is starting to start paying attention. Um, I just moved out of a um, yeah, fairly comfortable condo. It's a pretty nice place. Uh, shacking up with another TRI og -er and uh, crypto uh, all-around hero. Uh, actually, I think he's on Hero Exchange, too, so <laughs> how appropriate. I think he works some... some Somewhere with that. I know he's uh, he works with Colin. Anyway, um, so uh, we're gonna we're we we've to, we're gonna totally trick this place out. Total trader den. Anyway, um, point being that I had to work with this real estate agent girl uh, when I was moving out, and of course, you know, the conversation always evolves to what do you know, what do you do, and then uh, we started talking markets and all that and you could just see it in her eyes she had um, um she's had a sister of hers bought some tesla of course 
uh, made 10x on her money. And so now uh, she has bragging rights, you know, at like Thanksgiving dinner and stuff like that. And so it's really embarrassing her. And she just wants to get in there and buy anything and make money in the market. And you could just see that look in her eyes. It's uh, it's exactly the same thing as uh, when uh, Doge was running up there in the spring, of course, and uh, uh, Diamond Hands and all that. That sure disappeared pretty quickly. <laughs> but uh, uh, same sort of thing. You can, you can just kind of see it in people's eyes. They don't even really know what the hell it is they're doing, but they've got some cash in their pockets. They're seeing other guys making money. Just blindly buying and, and believing in uh, in people like Alan and um, and away we go. Um, so because that is the situation here, I don't think this market really can break down in earnest. Uh, and the weird thing is, is uh, good old Powell uh, there a week or so ago. Um, he didn't really make the case that they were going to be raising interest rates anytime soon. I would argue that once we go into sort of an interest rate raising environment, that your stock market starts calming down. And, you know, it actually, the, the adage is three steps and a stumble. So if you're watching the weekend show and you're like that son of a gun, I want to get some free information out of this and I want a rule that I can incorporate into my trading. You going forward, there's your freebie for everybody. <laughs> And <laughs> write that down. The old adage is three steps and a stumble. Um, uh, that uh, great Del Moody. <laughs> that guy there. If you, yeah, I'm sure you have that in your notes somewhere, but that's a perfect one for you today. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the market is susceptible to uh, short-term shocks, but it's not like crash scenario. If anything, it's sort of like, uh, you know, how's the sickness going? Well, there's another big wave of sickness. Well, you might see another big whack of money. If the economy pulls back, you might see a big whack of money thrown at the market to keep everything up. So ironically enough, for you speculators, you actually want the sickness to continue, <laughs> which is terrible. But uh, as long as the sickness is running rampant and that, I can't see the stock market itself crashing. It's just, it's not the right scenario. Anyway, uh, point being that um, I actually get the feeling, and you know, I think Bitcoin, I've, I've said this before, I do believe Bitcoin's a great leading indicator for the risk space. If we look at risk in general, like risk versus risk off, also too, oil and energy prices are fantastic. Uh, leading indicator for risk. Um, so interesting, you know, the oil looking very, very strong, getting ready to press up through old highs. Just such a shame. I mean, oil. <laughs> it's not that oil is worth seventy, eighty dollars a barrel U.S. It's that the U.S. dollar is, you know, just not worth that much. And the worst part about it, like I said, one point two trillion dollars in just a repo just the past week or two. I mean, it's just insane the amount of money they're injecting into the market. Um, and uh, you know, the 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 only thing prices can do is go up in that kind of environment. It's fascinating. Uh, this is the whole inflationary worry that we have here. Um, so stocks have actually had a fairly, you know, lengthy correction here. Could we go through a period where we take a serious run up against those old highs? It wouldn't surprise me. And of course, uh, you know, are there any letters of the alphabet that we kind of like to see uh, if we're thinking about taking risk in the market? And there's a big fat W staring you in the face on the corn. <laughs> and I find it fascinating that that basically coincided with uh, Mr. Uh, JP himself. Somebody uh, cornered him on... Uh, his testimony and just said, you know, are, are you getting ready to shit on these crypto kids? And he's like, no, nope, uh, they're fine by me. Which, in essence, I think is basically your green light for, um, for uh, this scenario. <laughs> oh, God. Get ready, folks. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <clears throat> so if they were doing like um, 
one trillion dollars in repo this week. I mean, in six months, is it going to be ten trillion dollars? When it, where does the parabolic curve end? I mean, remember, it used to be that <laughs> when I was all your guys' age, well, I mean, there was a lot of you crypto enthusiasts, you know, the whole economy wasn't a trillion dollars. So what the hell's going on? <laughs> so can this scenario, based on this idiocy of what's happening to the value of money, can this scenario play itself out? You better believe it. You know, this is like Weimar Germany. We are actually living through the Weimar Germany event of this century. Oh, boy. Strap on your seatbelts, folks. Get ready. Um, do you find it interesting that uh, things like housing data and stuff starting to cool off? I get the feeling that the U.S. consumer, though, is a bit exhausted. So uh, we'll see whether the sort of retail inflation can continue on. But if they just keep throwing money. And I think that is also a function of STEMI as well. I haven't heard too much STEMI. Like repos are more sort of like back office kind of stuff. Saving the corporations. And the other banks. But um, I don't know whether it's a good idea to get into the business of predicting the future. I'm certainly not predicting this. I just find that this study, like we literally started the study at the beginning of the year and just watched it play out. And I mean, it's shocking how incredibly cliche this is. It almost feels as though there needs to be one more FU, you know, kind of like it did this year, then we're rallying back up and we're up in here and there needs to be like one more shock. Maybe like, you know, I understand China is not very friendly to crypto right now. It's kind of funny how we even posted a while ago that we figured it was going to be China that dropped the poop. It was great how, uh, like I said, JP was like, uh, the guy even, the politician even goes, uh, you know, um, are you going to be like China? And he's like, no, no, no we don't care. <laughs> I do also like, and I really like, um, the fact that uh, they, and I'm not quite sure why I didn't clue into this before, but it makes perfect sense that something like a tether, the USDC, USDB, USDT, you know, they, there's all of these stable coins. All they are is nothing more than just money market funds. That's all they are. I mean, that's exactly what the money market fund industry does. A lot of people are encouraged, uh, especially people that play mutual funds, and they just switch from like uh, the growth mutual fund to the value mutual fund to you know whatever. They just uh, switch back and forth. If they don't want to be in the market, they'll just go into the um, the uh, the money market fund, right? which just pays basically whatever the T bill rate is. Um, now I suppose it's like Fed funds rate. Right? So I really liked how JP said, well, I mean, long and short of it here is uh, these stable coins, uh, they got to be regulated just like uh, just like any other market money market fund. I mean, if you are going to say buy my stable coin, the person who's buying the stable coin has to know that there is an actual physical dollar behind the coin. And of course, that's half of the debate with all of these silly cryptocurrency stories is, uh, can you trust anything that any of these people say? <laughs> and I don't know whether we, we really have a definitive answer on that. <laughs> I don't think that, you know, that, and that, geez, the irony of it all is we even had the same, uh, we had the same sentiment that through the 1718 rally. Yeah, I remember, I remember there was this one guy uh, his nickname was Bitfinixed, and his whole mantra in life was to hate Tether and hate the whole stable coin existence. Um, which, ironically enough, as soon as the market broke, the guy just disappeared. He just vanished, which I find fascinating. In essence, to me, I think the guy was planted in the in the in the space to consistently maintain that sense of FUD. So anyway, point of the matter here, I suppose, is uh, um, 
Ironically enough, and I, you know, I try to actually teach students this is um, especially in the strategic planning part of the course. So I don't know whether the level one guys are still in class, but I hope they watch this later on. This is super important. Um, we live in a world that must grow. Right? We've talked about um, the debt. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. They have to grow the economy. It has no choice. It must grow. This is this deficit spending world we are in. Where theoretically, if the economy grows, as you know, inflating the, the, the prices of assets, how the economy actually grows, well, you know, is it them just turning the printers on, right? Or is it actual like natural growth rate, money multiplier effect, one, one plus one equals three. But the economy must grow. It's simple as that. It must grow. And I might make the argument that the cryptocurrency space is one of the very few spaces in our society right now where people are actually optimistic. And they're building stuff that they're really excited about. I look around everything else in our society um, and it's all about regression. It's all, you know, and keep in mind the baby boomers and even the silent generation, they're still alive, bastards. They're all just, you know, they're on life support, just try to stay alive, right? But it's not about growth. It's not about, hey, this is something new we can build that'll change the world, blah, 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 right? All that. And, that, and I think that the banksters, they like that out of crypto. And, you know, a guy like Powell, especially like, not so much the banksters. I mean, the banksters, they want to profit. And if, if crypto starts cutting into their profit margins, then they got a problem. I think to a certain degree, crypto was starting to cut into their profit margins. Then 2018, 2019 came along. All the euphoria in the space got wiped out. And I think basically the banks took over. And the absolute perfect analogy of that is... Um, I believe that the banks want to simply be uh, money centers and of course by being money center that means you get to pay fees on the traffic in and out of the entity and so this is a proxy of the banks in crypto and I was long <laughs> this one's gonna piss me off for fucking ever because I talked about it here I said, the asset usually falls in half out of the gate, so I loaded up the boat here, and I sold everything like a dumb fuck right here. Excuse my French. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at me. I doubled my money, and you know, what the hell? I, I don't like the banks. And, and, and the, if anything, this is an absolute perfect analogy of why you should try to force yourself to like sell halves on doubles, because look how high the goddamn thing went. It's ridiculous. Anyway, everybody, anybody who knows me knows this story. I always lament about it. It's funny. But anyway, so this is the banks coming into crypto. So now the banks are here. They're in, and of course the banks own the Fed. Do you think the banks now want to go and have the lawmakers start to cannibalize? They're perfectly, they cornered the market. <laughs> they got everything all perfectly established. And now they're, some clown's going to go and outlaw this? No fucking way. <laughs> anyway so that that I would say you know do your do do some research you want to, this is a bank in California I'm sure there are probably banks in uh, other regions of the US as well but I like to follow it it's an interesting story and also too do you see how the bank seems to be uh, setting itself up uh, who can tell me Where's uh, where's Brian thinking this silly thing's gonna go now? I was long from seven fucking dollars. <laughs> this this is what drives you to swear. <laughs> yeah, I I don't mind. I mean, all of these lows, I'd be very very surprised if they took out these lows. I hate to say it, but I mean, this thing's telling you it wants to go up to about 300 bucks a share. That's crazy, eh? So, 
Anyway, so, uh, you know, I think if anything, uh, the only reason why I'm showing this, I think this is an excellent testament to uh, JP. This is basically who JP works for. And uh, the crypto market's a growth market. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of lows. So, anyway, I think it's here or there. I suppose it's backwards. I was just uh, trying to make the illustration that uh, the banks are in crypto big time for profit. And there's a lot of money to be made in this space. Not only is it going to transform the banking industry itself, but probably everything that anybody does. Like, can do, do companies have to interact with, ba interact with banks? <laughs> yeah. So that means that basically every single company has also their entire, the way they do business. They're, so a lot of them will probably never even realize it and never see it, but almost every single one of these businesses is going to be funneled through these uh, crypto banks. Anyway, that's your another. Um, we were actually joking on the site uh, over the weekend uh, looking at um, the Bitcoin ETFs. From what I understand, there's supposed to be a, just a whole slew of um, of um, ETFs uh, hitting the market here pretty soon. And, you know, these Canadian ETFs have caught a little bit of a premium. I don't know what the exact math is. We probably can go to the website and look at uh, intrinsic value of the asset. I don't think that this head and shoulders is anywhere near close to firing. But it will be interesting. If we do roll over here and we start to break down and momentum's starting to look nasty, I definitely want to keep that in mind. Probably the better way to look at that is something like that. So, you know, logarithmically, if this Bitcoin story does fall apart, then you can see technically it's actually telling you even right now it probably wants to come right back down to the bottom of the range, fill in the gaps, that kind of stuff. Also, too, I thought this was a really interesting one because uh, this this is basically a stock market proxy to uh, to the uh, grayscales or the GBTC, right, which is a US OTC um, um, ETF, which can't, you know, OTC uh, the funds are yeah, they're t they're difficult, right? They don't really have to. They don't have any legal obligation to tell you the truth. You got a lot of registered accounts you're not allowed to buy. So they created this thing, which was just basically an ETF off of the exact same thing. And it actually painted the two tops here recently of the market really nicely with uh, what I would call key reversal uh, candle patterns. Very, very powerful candle patterns. So we'll see how this develops. But you can see, you know, uh, everybody that knows me uh, knows I love uh, this... Uh, trend continuation setup <clears throat> this is a log scale so if we change that back to regular you can see that a little bit clearer a b c d so this would be like you know that uh that other name that i was showing you that uh, that bank going up to 300 dollars. that would be this thing breaking out and heading higher so you could probably you know do the same sort of study off of bitcoin itself and start to come up with the same levels it, it wouldn't surprise me at all so if we come over here, um, oh yeah, look at that, I've already drawn it up. Look at these beautiful momentum bottoms too, wow, holy moly, <laughs> I tell ya, and Willie Woo, right, he's been right the whole damn way, uh, he, you know, the market went a little bit further than he was expecting, I think. Uh, to the downside, but uh, his crazy 200,000 projection. Um, interesting. So this is just boom, 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 boom. But actually, I think that's the other one I'm looking at is even bigger. Uh, yeah, let's just do a whole new one. A whole new world. Uh, so uh, BTC USD. Uh, good old Stamperoonie. Yeah, I wonder if it's got to be, I think, you know what, I can start to see this huge one here forming. Look at the size of this. That's what she said. Look at the size of it. Holy moly. Uh, boom. Oh, that's backwards. Backwards. I could do it. Just count backwards. 
somebody can tell me what that's from, I'll give you... Oh, by the way, uh, we had a Twitter thing. A fun little contest. Um, actually, there's a guy on the site who's building out a total uh, NFT uh, project for our not-for-profit organization. Uh, Sebastian, calling it Brian's Lyceum. Ooh, how fancy. Um, and uh, I, I do like the idea of auctioning off all these uh, NFTs, uh, or at least all these fun pictures. As NFTs uh, down the road, I'm not quite sure how to do all this. I'm terrible at uh, this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, we got all of these. Uh, Mr. Mo put all these together years ago, and I asked him if we could do it, and he's like, yeah, sure, no problem, go for it. Um, oh, where's the picture? Darn. Uh, do, 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 do. It's staring me right in front of the face, but I can't see it. Oh, well. Anyway, um, lots of fun, lots of pictures that we uh, shared on the. Oh, here it is. This right here. I wouldn't mind NFTing these up and, uh, and uh, using the proceeds to fund the not for profit organization. Because uh, I'm serious, man. I think in the new year, we're, we're going to get that off the ground and going. I'm so excited. But uh, sort of a side thing is uh, when I was at my old prop firm, we used to trade uh, ticks. And they were just fictitious currency. And I've always wanted to do it on uh, TRI, but I think we'll be able to do it with these NFT token kind of things. Um, but... Um, Josh Morris has taken over the uh, TRI uh, PMA. Um, what's it called? TRI underscore PMA. Kevin built this. Uh, so good. Great job, Kevin. Um, and um, Josh has uh, inherited the job of sort of managing it. And what was really cool, uh, what Josh did was, uh, oh, <laughs> you remember that? That's so funny, I haven't seen that in forever. Any fucking gold mines? Yeah, I love this so funny. W dot buy the fucking w dot com. You think it's easy finding <laughs> fucking gold mines? <laughs> <laughs> ah, totally turned it around on you. <laughs> there you go, PMA for the win. W <laughs> That's awesome. Josh, he's killing it with his feet. I love this so much. <laughs> Great job, dude. Um, and uh, he was he was doing trivia questions on the feed. And I was like, okay. So uh, he was asking the people to interact. And then I said, here, why don't we do something? And if I see uh, something that uh, that uh, Josh has put out, this is, a, this is a picture from our Vancouver meetup we did in uh, 2018. A lot of fun. In fact, actually, you see, uh, right there, that's my uh, that's my roommate right there, Andrew. And here, my question was, uh, can you uh, identify the TRI principles? <laughs> uh, and the funny thing is, is uh, and I said, uh, first place, and I think I'm going to do this going forward. So it's kind of a fun way for us to interact, is uh, first, first person to respond gets uh, 10 ticks. Second person to respond gets uh, like five ticks. And third person to respond gets like two ticks or something. And it's so funny, this guy here, he answered the question first. <laughs> so I don't know if you're actually in the picture. I don't know whether you're allowed to answer the question or not. <laughs> so, but that was so cool. So, um, oh, look at that. I guess Adam answered it as well. That's good. Cool. Um, so it's kind of a fun way to interact with you guys. So follow the TRI PMA uh, feed. And then as Josh is spitting stuff out, I'm going to post questions, and like I said, we'll keep a ledger, I think probably on the Wednesday show. Um, um, I think uh, we'll, we'll sort of, we'll, we'll update the ledger and we'll keep an eye on it, and then once we get the Lyceum uh, token up and running, I think those will be the, uh, the, the sort of sub-tokens. Um, that we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll use to settle up. So for the record, uh, Ryan won the first, uh, the first question, um, and, uh, and he got the 10 ticks. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. That's so funny. And even while I've been gone, I mean, Josh is just killing it. This is such a great one. This is totally awesome. I totally forgot about that. 
<laughs> I can't remember who did that one up, but that is that is just the best. <laughs> anyway, so be sure to follow this, and now you can even uh, win ticks. And uh, like I said, uh, I'm not quite sure how we'll do a ledger up. Uh, maybe Ryan, uh, since he won the first uh, contest, maybe he'll volunteer to keep the ledger. So then that way he's absolutely guaranteed to get his 10 ticks. But uh, it should be a fun little sort of way for us to interact with you guys on a regular basis. So Anyway, I wanted to mention that. Sorry, I got totally off on a tangent there. Okay, where were we? Good old Bitcoin! Bitcoin, Bitcoin! So, uh, you know, when I see this kind of price action, that definitely jumps out at me. Um... Also, too, do like uh, the fact that we're broken this downtrend line, so that's encouraging. Our rule, of course, is uh, we'd really like to see a W on the other side of this trend line to validate that indeed the market is a bull. So it is interesting to watch how we've been grinding our way through here, and then we have this really interesting little turn there, eh? So you can even go like. Uh, yeah, that kind of looks like a W on the other side of a trend line. Damn. So I think there is something to work with there. Um, if I draw up the uh, trend continuation trade setup levels, I'm thinking something along there is. Oh, what a coincidence. The bot entry level happens to be that level. So uh, let's see if we even go... Look at that. I mean, the W basically sets up right off of that level. I hate when it does that. Ah, jerks. So I uh, definitely think you got a bit of a signal there. I have noticed that, that sometimes the market will sneakily put in a bottom here on light volume, and everybody's like, where's the volume? Where's the volume? Where's the volume? And then as this thing gets going, all of a sudden you start to see the volume really pour in over time. I guess you might argue, see how we sort of turn down in here? You can kind of see it down in here. I've, I mean, I've seen this before. Drives you nuts. Uh, so like right here, right? See how it's turning, 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 then it turns out. And you look down at the volume, and you're like, well, where's the volume, man? Where's the volume? What the fuck, man? And then, boom, there's the volume comes in here on the big, massive structural breakout. And away we go. So does that is that what has to happen here on the rally against the highs? My hunch is what happens here is uh, probably going to see a hell of a fight against this high here. Um, I don't know. Does it really make sense like chasing at this level here if you didn't grab that trade? I think you missed it. It sucks. And I even tweeted out uh, that, of course, I was right in the middle of this darn move. Um, and I was like, um, uh, I think on the, on the, you know, the Twitter thing, my, my own personal Twitter thing, just cause, and if anything, I like this because look at what Josh, Josh is, this is beautiful. The work that Josh is doing. I mean, it's just absolutely perfect. It's exactly what you and the public need. Uh, Brian, I'm an opinionated old fart, <laughs> right? <laughs> Half of the shit I talk about has nothing to do with crypto or trading and stuff. It's more stuff that I just get angry at about our society. So Josh, is it's perfect. Me, I'm just a weirdo. But having said that, I did uh, tweet uh, that out there earlier. In fact, I uh, said, I think it was off of the Ethereum one. I mean, look how beautiful that W is. You can't get, I mean, again, you're mining this show for free information. You're like, I don't want to pay your subscription. You're going to give me something for free or, you know, to hell with you. Okay, well, fine. Here you go. I mean, if an asset gives you a W that looks like that, it's worth buying that breakout right there and just risking against those lows. It's worth it. Like, that that crisp of a W, uh, to me, that that's good for, I'd say, easy 75%, maybe even 80% when it looks that crisp, uh, especially after you had this W and they they pulled a nice little FU, but they didn't break these lows. That, to me, looks like just the most beautiful entry. And, of course, I was hip deep. And this, you know what, this isn't, even as I said here, this is a really good lesson about penny wise and pound foolish. 
a lot of people make this same mistake and like uh, am I gonna do a discount brokerage house where I pay uh, a buck a trade or am I gonna do uh, the full service uh, where I have to pay like ten dollars a trade or something right and uh, you know like uh, first few times on the discount uh, service uh, trade everything goes fine and you're like look at me I saved so much money uh, and then you have one trade where it's just an absolute nightmare and you know like pfft, Robin Hood a few years ago there was a poor kid was handed like a seven hundred thousand dollar clerical error and he ended up committing suicide over it um, whereas the full service broker goes no 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 that's uh, that's just a back office error don't sweat it it's not that big of a deal um, here I was a cheap ass and I didn't want to spend probably would have been a good you know, five six hundred bucks uh, to hire a couple clowns to just come in and do all the heavy lifting and move everything on moving day and stay focused and just trade setups it, could I have made six seven hundred dollars on this kind of move here uh, flipping uh, crypto I could have probably made it in a heartbeat um, and it was just the most incredibly juicy setup but being a cheap ass I did the whole move myself Andrew helped me one day with the really really heavy shit that there's no way I could do on my own but other than that everything else I did on my own and I, my body's broken I can't concentrate on the markets I can't I didn't even I wasn't even able to do classes I was so wiped out uh, is that is that smart is that actually setting yourself up for success in life and I'm just going to simply say, nope. <laughs> uh, that's This is one really good example where being a cheap ass, it cost me. And it cost me a lot. There was a lot of money to be made here over this past week or so. Could have easily been 5, 10 Gs. Easily. Oh, well, what can you do? <laughs> I did have a bunch of stuff on. So it was really nice uh, as the market was moving higher. I did see a bunch of uh, stuff hit double levels and stuff like that. I don't think I've been tweeting them out, though. So I've been probably relatively quiet on uh, social media. But um, all right, back to our story here. Um, you know, as a, uh, as a sort of market technician... I'm looking for sort of that anecdotal evidence that, you know, higher highs and higher lows defines a bull market. It's going to be a bit of a sloppy one, but I suppose one low, two lows, three lows, four lows, five lows. You know, we just keep painting higher and higher and higher lows. Um, if anything, because of the proximity around the bot level, I don't even mind the idea that you just simply say, like, if we broke this very fast trend line we're not really allowed to take a trade on the break of the trend line but if i can get any kind of pullback here over the next little bit you know and any kind of candle signal anything in and around this area i mean obviously w's are awesome you know if i could but it's probably going to be like a you know what it's probably going to be? I bet my hunch is. It'd be interesting. Uh, somebody on the site uh, record this, and we'll take a look and see what happens tomorrow. But I bet there's going to be a, uh, a, a rally. <clears throat> like this looks like a, uh, a midpoint consolidation. So I wouldn't even be surprised if we uh, go here to here. And... Here, here. So take out these stops. Ding, 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 ding. Right, probably a whole bunch of formal buyers. Then um, you know, there's some sort of blow off top into you know Monday uh, open. Uh, and then in a weird sort of way, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to work our way back down into sort of reload zones. And you know, this is just going to be nothing more than a uh, Ben cough check of that original double bottom breakout level is going to be reload zones. So that's that's kind of what I would um, expect to happen. But who knows? Like I said, it's probably not a good idea to get into the habit of predicting the future. But I could see something like that. That wouldn't surprise me. So uh, in the short term, uh, you know, especially this ABCD, I like the idea of pop up here. 
We'll see. I mean, uh, you know, based on just the volume alone, it was nice to see this volume bar here was higher than that volume bar there. So you can actually see the bulls and uh, level winners. You'll be doing this in a couple weeks, a um, few weeks, I guess. But uh, level twoers, you just went through this. You know, a really easy way to just see what the bull's temperament is, is uh, just to simply see what the structure is and what the bulls are doing. So you can see here, a big pop up in price, but lower volume bars. So this was actually a warning. Hey, you know, yeah, price is moving up, but the buyers are backing away. Sure enough, boo, 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 back down we go. But notice, look how the buyers now are actually ramping back up. So you can kind of see it, right? It's like, this is a top. <clears throat> then all of a sudden something changed here. And we actually went a higher volume bar there. And then now another higher volume bar there. So something's changed here. The buyers have returned. Um, so this bar right here, actually, I think it was your tell that something had changed. That one right there. Uh, I suppose what you could do, you know, total sharpshooter, is uh, if, if you're advanced to actually understand that volume impetus conversation, you might have to put things like OBV and stuff like that on your charts. Also, too, you could argue uh, you see more green higher bar and yet uh, price was actually making a lower low. So you could actually argue that's a bit of a divergence as well. Um, but even through here, so we get the W in the buying bars, and then you know if we look at the bears, it's the exact opposite. So uh, you see, there's the bears. So notice bears were super active here. Rah, I'm a bear. Rah, look at me. But then notice as we worked our down, market made a lower low, but the bears didn't make a higher showing. Does that make sense? So that's a divergence. If you see the price is making a lower low, but the bears are not showing up, and remember, we, you can even see right through here, this is where the bulls actually showed up. So the bears are starting to say, you know what, eh, maybe we're not that enthusiastic here on this candle. And then you get another lower high, so it's the exact opposite of what we're seeing out of the, the bulls. Remember, we saw out of the bulls over here, right? That was your warning that, hey, maybe the bull runs running out of steam. Well, now you could argue, you know, and I don't want to really confuse you too much. I'll do it in a different color. You could argue that, hey, the bears are now running out of steam. Eh, maybe I'll make that like orange. So this is the bears. So just as the bulls are waking up, you can actually see the bears are falling asleep. So that was a pretty big signal. right here on uh, volume. But all you volume impetus aficionados, you already knew that, right? <laughs> what a mess. So anyway, point of the matter here, not a bad looking signal. That's pretty good. Uh, and like I said, actually, that's a, that's a really good uh, tutorial there on volume impetus. Really good. But, uh, but, that's not really what we want to do here. Let's talk about what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so, um, you know, we got a bunch of uh, higher lows. That's encouraging. I get the feeling that the market is setting up this AB, and we kind of mapped this out earlier, that this was going to take us up into uh, the old highs. So right up against these highs. So I got a sneaky suspicion we're going after this top here. And the question ultimately here is, like I said before, is there like one more shock that the market needs to do before we go into that insane up move uh, or
orgy insanity. I don't know. I gotta say, you know, if a fundamentalist listening to um, listening to JP there, um, what I heard was actually very bullish. I did not hear anything overtly bearish out of him about crypto at all. So I can understand why the market put in that buy signal there uh, through this. And if anything, it's you know, like, and you know, it might be interesting just to look at. Um, what the uh, thing, what are indicators that we teach people? Uh, how do I do that? Template. Uh, what did I call it? It was like something like. Hmm. Someone here somewhere. Summer 21, I think that's it. There we go. Um. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's not, it's not an overly exciting volume picture. I'll give you that. We'd really like to see this break out here, right? And really convince us that it's a rip roaring bull. It's got the smatterings of it, but I'd really like to see. And I'd like, I heard a lot of people talking about how there's a whole bunch of Bitcoin ETFs and stuff coming out of the, the shoot here over the next month or so. Uh, and if that's the case, right, does that ramp volume up here? Yeah, it's a tough one. Either way, you know, short term A B C D, right? If we go down to like say like a ten minute chart, so that's that little A B C D. I think that's pointing up into uh, fifty four and change. And uh, I mean, hell, you could even probably uh, bought that up there. Right, you got one low, two lows, three lows. Is that 33% of that range? It might be. Uh, and then uh, can you sneak your way in here somehow? Uh, but, uh, you know, if I just uh, put that up there. Let's see, lower time frame uh, objective. And then uh, I'll go for like four hours. So there's your medium term uh, objective. Why don't we make this uh, uh, green? So nice little target window I would use is, uh, oh, and that's the bot. Uh, so, uh, maybe we'll make this, uh, I'll do orange, right? Orange and orange. So something like that gives me a nice little window. So my target objective window here going forward is going to be up in that area. So that's uh, a good uh, 54,000 all the way up to 63,000. Yeah, I like that. It's not bad. Um, I just wonder if when we get up into this area, there has to be just one more F you to screw, uh, to screw the chasers. Because uh, keep in mind that um, this chart here, there was one more, right? This was the Silk Road reversal. I don't know whether we've actually, you know, this might, and I just, I just don't know. I don't think anybody could possibly know. Uh, actually, I guess I have to stretch this out. Uh, oh, it's a pain in the ass to do this. Sorry. So maybe we're like, I don't know, there or something. Oh, darn, that didn't stretch it, did it? Eh, fudge. Stretch. Oh, you're not stretching. Oh, well, anyway, you got the idea. There's, there, I don't know whether that's it. But if it is, then woohoo, where we go? <laughs> Even when we had the reversal low, notice that there was this pullback here. So if you are going to try and buy and you're going to try and participate, I would work your stink bids, right? Don't chase. I mean, geez, you always get into trouble when you chase. You got to work your stink bids, wait for somebody to balk and, you know, say something silly. Um, I do understand that I think a couple of the really high-flying um, um, NFT names have got... Uh, um, you know, like uh, Luna's doing uh, another one of those crypto punk things, so that's all hot now. 
So my hunch is, you know, uh, they uh, go and spend up all their money and then you get like a sort of a after the effect uh, euphoria. And I guess that's sort of like what this image is here. Uh, you know, maybe we pop all the way up into these highs here and then we have to pull back and, uh, you know, mountain mans and 50% rules and stuff like that. So if I did want to buy, that's what I would be thinking now, which means a hell of a lot of patience and a hell of a lot of discipline right now. Um... Uh, let's see sort of what and, and you know what I, I actually like this uh, this kind of thinking here again and I, I would not be surprised if we jump up you know we had like 55 was this lower little ABCD up to 65 is test of the old highs I like that as a target window up here and momentum is very strong so uh, don't don't step in front of this thing right just yet <laughs> that would be my Definitely my thinking here. I, I'll tell you, man. I really Bitcoin, man. You know, you know what is that? That's uh, you know twenty G's. So that's about you know good thirty forty percent. Uh, there's some names like OMG here, man. This thing just has been beautiful. It bought here and just surging higher. And what a great testament to uh, the high to high trend lines. My well, hunch is uh, you've probably got a date to, to tag this line here. Maybe we can get all the way up to 877s. I mean, but wow, look at these moves. They're just stunning. And of course, Sjord's Luna, Jesus, just unstoppable. Look at that bull. Just wow, strong like bull. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I definitely don't think it's a good idea to chase. Uh, we were very fortunate to load up here and then buy the W here. So, you know, like my uh, trading account that I trade for TRI on Trex uh, will be spoon feeding as they take this thing higher. I can't buy something that looks like that, though. I just can't do it. I, I don't know. I'll get it next go. If anything, what's interesting is a doge. Do we step back in on Allen here? Look at that chart. Do we step back in? Fuck, I just don't know. <laughs> I just uh, let that simmer for a little bit for you guys. <laughs> First off, what was the price of this thing when that guy was on Saturday Night Live? It wasn't anywhere near where it is now. Does everybody see how stupid it is to listen to guys like Alan and make investment decisions on that? I sure hope you understand. You know, you can listen to these guys like Alan and he goes, you know, buy my company, buy my stock, buy my cryptocurrency, whatever. That's fine. But for God's sake, so. If you don't know, then come to TRI and take our course and we'll teach you. <laughs> but you can't just blindly listen to some guy like Alan. And just buy whatever he's touting. Because half of the time, you're walking into a trap. You're coming late to the story. Very, very dangerous. Anyway. I'm tempted because I did sell up in the 50s. I think I got off up of here. So I am tempted to just go and buy my original uh, sell here at less than half of what I uh, sold it at. I am tempted to just go buy that position back. But the problem is, is I don't really like the guy. Um, and I'm, I'm actually quite saddened because, you know, I have a whole bunch of pictures with the guy who actually built Doge originally. I have pictures with all the Doge kids from DogeCon. Hell, I even dressed up with a rocket on my back. Nobody remembers me, and yet I was fucking, I looked like a total idiot in that parade, and I tramped around half around the city, carrying the fucking globe with us. And Alex was dressed up like a, like a, I don't know what the hell he was. <laughs> I think he, because it, it was like he was like on a, a donkey or something like that. I don't know what it was. But anyway, 
We had to like literally carry shit around the city. That Dogecon. And I had like this big rocket on my back, a really goofy hat on and everything. And that was the spirit of Doge. It was a lot of fun. So it's ironic. I mean, I find it so ironic. Nobody in crypto even knows that story. Nobody even remembers that story. Now is the real Doge. Just meandering around downtown Vancouver aimlessly dancing and just randomly. And now it's so bloody corrupted. So I don't know. I still got a whack of it on the books. So if Alan does decide to do his thing, but I tell you, this this is a, this is one story that I think is going to resonate with me about how this space was very pure and it was a lot of fun interacting with the, the millennial generation through uh, this part of the market. Um, and a fantastic illustration of how uh, God, I don't want to get too graphic here, but crypto lost its cherry through this. It was innocent. And it was it was a lot of fun. It was, you know, there was you know there were crooks in the space, but it was still very isolated. And you know the crooks in the space they even were very small time. But this is the analogy of crypto. Uh, it hit the big time, and it lost its cherry. And and then Wall Street and and not and more importantly not Wall Street but Madison Avenue came in and now is completely corrupted this story uh to the point where i think a lot of people got really taken advantage of and you know like uh, has anybody ever seen the movie how to get ahead in advertising great movie about how absolutely soulless people these people are i i don't understand how that part of our society continues on uh but in essence uh crypto lost its cherry in my eyes through here and now it's been corrupted by big brother and madison avenue and uh you know and i think uh, alan he knows how to work the system uh he got the system to make him a billionaire trillionaire whatever is that right is it good uh, i'll leave that for you to decide but it's not really my place to comment there, but I don't think I'm going to participate anymore. It's an interesting moral dilemma I have with this name right here because I think I could justify a trade here, but I think I'm probably just going to let it go. A couple of names that I think look really great in this space. Look at that steak. Oh my goodness. So pretty. Look at that. Just went W again. I don't know where the hell this thing's going. Let's see. Is it a W on the other side of the trend line? Oh, look at that, eh? What a fight. Oh, it's so close. Mm, not quite. Probably still got to pop up here and then consolidate a bit, and then we'll know she's off to the races. It's uh, missed. Uh, look at that chart. So I picked some up off of this W. I mean, the funny thing is, people, is that I just do what I do. Everybody should look at that W and go, wow, what a surprise Beamish is long from there. This thing looks like it's about ready to go nuts. Um, so I've been blabbing away here for about an hour or so. I hope you guys have gotten some value out of all this. You know, I tell you that Ubix sure looks good in here. We were kind of musing about it the other day. Look at that chart. Oh, Jesus H. Christ. Ay, 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 ay. Look at that. It's just textbook. It's incredible how textbook this thing is. So uh, we just fire in a double bottom here on a nice bullish divergence. I know Andrew, he was super stoked about this thing. But uh, Andrew doesn't want to be made famous, so we're just going to assume that Andrew is, uh, is Brian's imaginary friend, right? Right? Am I right or am I right? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> He's in the kitchen right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just being silly. So interesting. Look how foggy is right up against this old high here. 
And then where's the next one? Oh boy, eight, seven. Oh, look at that. It's so cliche. I swear this is so cliche. So you've often heard me say, you know, wicks and tails, there's a whole bunch of trap bulls in there that need to get off the couch. And so we're going to see this thing zip up into this level. It's going to turn around and come back down. We're going to be like, whoa, that's crazy, man. But, you know, I mean, it makes sense because there's a bunch of trap bulls there would love to get the hell out. Now look at 877, same thing. Bunch of trap bulls right up in here. And the irony of it all is this is probably like a reload short zone. So, I mean, it's incredible how uh, this stuff works. Anyway, boom. Yep, there you go. In fact, actually, I've got another one. Um, man, this one... Um, XTZ, this is a fun one. I picked some up right at the bottom. And uh, you just never know with these things. I, th I think that KMD, that one looks good too. But anyway, this XTC, look at that chart. Ay, 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 ay. Look at all the W's, W's everywhere. <laughs> and somebody was even like, I think I count like six W's there. <laughs> so I don't know where the heck they're taking this one. But wow, does that look like it wants to go up. So we'll see what happens. Only time what the hell. So, you know, the, this crypto market looks pretty damn juicy. And I even put, like, tweets out earlier today. I was like, that's not what a bear usually looks like. That's what a bull looks like. So get ready. Run, run, run. That's a motorcycle bull. Um, Andre, what is the fundamental value of one doge? Well, you know, our rule is doge is a buy when it's below 40 sats. And that's what scares me is that probably in 2022, 2023, all these prices come right back down to those levels. Usually what happens, we've seen it twice now over the past eight years. All right. Um, all right, so uh, did, we ever, did we get that uh, Q&A document? Were there any questions? Shark Toshi, are you around? Who else is uh who's a TA in the level one this term? I think Andrew M. Andrew M, are you around somewhere? Anyone? Are there are any level one students here. <laughs> Am I talking to myself? Let's see what you guys are saying. One doge is one doge. <laughs> That's all you guys care about, eh? Uh, um, um, um. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Are any of you? Is anybody here a uh, level one student? <laughs> Am I talking to myself? What's going on, man? Okay, where? Oh, there's the dog over here. All right, Werner. What the hell are you guys up to this week? What day is today? 10-3. All right, there we go. All right. So I only wasted about an hour or so. Um, I got Liam this afternoon, so uh, I'm going to head out of here in probably about an hour or so. Okay, so uh, how do differences in interest rates in the U.S. versus Europe broadly impact the macro outlook? Example on health of real estate markets. Thanks, L1 Ian. Um, problem is, is that Europe's got such a broken system right now, and I don't think that the powers that be really know how to handle it. Um, you've got... Basically, this Eurozone idea is uh, the confluence of two very different societies. And they're trying to make this thing work, but it's not really working. I'd be curious to see whether the Euro can actually survive over the next 10, 20 years. I, um, I do like the idea that, well, Angela Merkel, to a certain degree has uh, kept everybody in line. Having strong leadership is uh, out of Germany is the only thing that's really going to keep this thing going. But um, she's retiring now. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people in Germany that are very, very upset um, with uh, 
They, uh, they used to call them the pigs nations. And uh, the disparity between the economic uh, output and um, sort of work ethic of Southern European countries versus Northern Europeans. And that's been simmering for a while. And actually, we really haven't heard too much of a conversation about that lately. I think probably while we're going through the uh, whole sickness stuff, uh, that that doesn't that it sort of simmers in the background. But you know when when the sickness wasn't dominating the conversation, that's I mean great, better part of the last decade, uh, half half of the conversation out of Europe was all about that. So. I'm not. I'm not quite sure how this plays out. And the worst part about it for Europe is that it just went through a friendly cycle. The Americans, I think, got taken advantage of a little bit by the Europeans because the European currencies should have been much, much stronger. But now, the European currencies are going to go through a down cycle, and I don't know whether the euro can survive. I think, it, to a certain degree. I get the impression people like Klaus are actually taking revenge on like you on Britain and UK. And they're going to try and isolate them as much as possible. But this is not a friendly environment. It's not a friendly growth environment. Um so uh, you know, like the Klauses of the world, I think, have the sway right now, which is a socialist bent. But uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I actually like the idea that the United States has gone through its demographic contractual cycle and they have removed the debt from the system. It's sitting on the Fed's balance sheet for whatever that's worth. And it's poised for growth. Um, I think the bankers have also said, they've also placed their bets. And they've publicly said, look, at, we're betting on the United States of America. Uh, so... I mean, there's a million moving parts, but uh, I like the uh, I like the growth story out of uh, out of North America much much better than the growth story coming out of Europe. And actually, I think you know, especially if Biden can get all this debt shit done, and the stimulus programs, and you know, all the uh, the new sort of funding system it's going to mean of course the dilution of standard of living for the working class middle class gets screwed I mean, what a surprise but it actually sets the united states up in a very very strong balance sheet position to continue that sort of hegemony and to continue to be able to bail out things like airbus and stuff like that so i mean <coughs> I think the most important thing out of the entire sort of Bretton Woods model was that all of the other currencies of the world had to have their interest rates just slightly different than the Americans. The American system had to be sort of the bedrock. And I think that's going to continue. So... I don't know whether, you know, the, the issue here is how do you differentiate in interest rates in the U.S. and Europe broadly impact the mark, macro outlook? Uh, interest rates themselves are very low. So that in itself shouldn't be a hindrance to the real estate market. But if that long-term interest rate cycle does turn, which I think it is. I think this this part of the cycle is is muted though. It's not it's not like we're in that 1940s kind of environment right now, where you know, and I wouldn't be surprised in the next year or two we have our sort of our current version of Bretton Woods. 
and they sort of establish the rules for our new society going forward. But I think we're like right here. Like right in this, right? You can see it. you are here now. So, you know, equity is going to grow dramatically. Um, interest rates themselves are probably, you know, and of course, you know, predicting interest rates, good luck. <laughs> but generally speaking, uh, where's the chart I want to show you? It's over here. Uh, isn't that weird? Trex always crashes like that. I don't know, I think it, it's weird how Trex does that. Okay, focus, focus. Got to stay on task here. What am I looking for? Uh, not that one. This one. Um, I like the idea that... Um, this is our inflation deflation gauge. I think we just went through like literally 20, uh, well, 40 years of deflationary pressure that finally came to a head there. And it's now, the trend has now turned. But I, this doesn't just go straight up, I think. And you can kind of see it, that this looks like a shoulder, head, neckline. So that means we should probably have another shoulder over here. And, you know, our rule about trend lines, right? We should, this trend line break right here, that's not a buy signal. But if this thing now on the other side of this trend line, if it can W, then away we go. And we know that interest rates and inflation have, have not only have they turned back up, but they're actually trending higher. Right now, I think the, the, the best you can say, and I think this is what JP and, and the gang are thinking here right now, is we were trapped in like literally, and most people in, that don't understand economics, they just don't get this. And you know, it's fine if you don't, you don't. But we were literally trapped in like, a, like literally a 20 year deflationary spiral that just was not ending. The only, and remember, we are in an economy that must grow. <laughs> and we're trapped in a deflationary, a ungrowth spiral. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> the two just, they don't work. and <laughs> They don't go hand in hand. You want inflation, right? That's that's what the banksters want. And you hear them. It's so funny. We're in a deflationary spiral, and you hear them use words like, oh, well, this is disinflationary. What? Just say the fucking word, deflation. No, can't say that. That's a bugaboo. Not allowed to say that word. <laughs> so we lived in a disinflationary environment <laughs> anyway so point here is that this is you know and these trends take forever to turn you know they're like 40 years in duration like the 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 jupiter saturn cross saturn pluto cross saturn jupiter pluto cross oh my goodness i think i told you earlier in this uh, rant here today Six different celestial events all coming together. So we got the sickness. We got the interest rate cycle. I would imagine there's probably like a plague cycle, which sucks, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, uh, probably sunspot cycle. I wouldn't be surprised if that's thrown in here. Uh, the bing bong cycle. I mean, Jesus, it never ends. Anyway, so I don't think that this part of the interest rate cycle really hurts too much. I think what happens is uh, this is the process that interest rates normalize. So, uh, you know, what we have to be worried about as investors is the period of like the 1970s. Uh, with interest rates, where that was the very end of a very long 
build up, right? The uh, the start of that cycle was like the 1930s in Bretton Woods, 1940s. So 40 years of rising interest rates, the end of that cycle was the 19, uh, the 1980 uh, interest rate peak. But, you know, we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff for a very, very long time. Um, I wonder if I have... Surprised I don't have a uh, long-term interest rate picture here. I mean, usually it's. I mean, it's not very difficult. I right? can go like uh, uh, long-term interest rates chart. Something like that. Let's see what we get. Yeah. So this uh, this is a ten-year T-bond yield. Right, so this process of it turning, look how long. So there's 1940, and you can see that rates kind of like bumped along, bumped along, bumped along, and then started to tick up, and then higher highs and higher lows. This is the kind of environment that we're in right now, where this was the, you know, in this particular case, it was deflation. And they called it that, and it was nice because you actually saw asset prices fall. This particular cycle, they were not going to let the asset prices fall. <laughs> so instead, they just keep diluting the currency, print more paper, print more paper. The economy has to grow. It has to grow. And they call it disinflation. Anyway, point of the matter here is the bonds, I think, in a similar cycle, were sort of in this period for like the next 10, 15 years. It's going to take a while for this sort of train to turn around, start heading up. But I can start to see all the, all the sort of hallmarks of an expanding economy, of the millennials coming online, um, of uh, equity prices starting to move back up. I think I was uh, telling somebody, uh, the uh, little real estate girl that I have locally here, she's all excited about buying stock and her friends are buying stock and she's feeling like she's missing out, blah, 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 blah. So you can see that the whole patchwork of the next cycle is starting. Um, but this next part of the cycle, we don't really have to worry about runaway interest rates. What we have to worry about is just them normalizing interest rates. And what does just normal interest rates do to Joe Sixpack? Uh, and more importantly, remember the Americans drive the bus with this whole damn uh, Bretton Woods system and whatever the system is now. You always hear out of uh, Fed Powell, oh, we don't have to worry about uh, paper. The world loves uh, US dollars. The world loves the uh, US market. And I, I don't see anything changing. You're going to go and fucking give your money to Winnie the Pooh and trust Winnie the Pooh to give you interest on your money and actually trust Winnie the Pooh to actually even give your money back at the end or them not going, well, thank you very much for your donation to the People's Republic of China's uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh Fund. <laughs> Which I don't think you'll ever see, but nonetheless. Uh you got to trust, what, giving Vladimir Putin your money? <laughs> Come on. Hell, you got to trust giving Justin Trudeau your money when he got Barbie running the fucking central bank in Canada? Like, she, 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 Barbie's running the, uh, running the finance department, and it's the old crotchety bankers who are making an absolute fortune here. Um... They're the ones who are actually running the books. <laughs> but would you, you know, if I was a capitalist, would I give Justin a bunch of money and expect him to give it back? No, he's going to give, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's as simple as that. No. I mean, hell, if I'm going to put my money anywhere, I'm going to give it to, uh, ironically enough, I'm going to give it to Granny. You know who I'm going to give it to? Let's see if I can find the picture quickly. I'm always so slow at finding these damn pictures, though. Let's see if I can find it. Come on. Come on. Where is it? Where is it? You're in here somewhere. Oh, you know where it was? It was in, uh, I think it was in here. Oh, it's going to take too damn long to find it. Oh, Jesus Christ. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, oh, God. I, why is 
this even look like this view? Extra large icons. There we go. Okay, I know you're in here somewhere. I just saw you the other day. Don't hold out on me. Ugh. In, a, in this world, believe it or not, you know, when if I, if I had my choice of places to put my money anywhere in the world, and I had to sort of trust that, okay, I'm going to get my money back, and, uh, you know, it's guaranteed, or whatever the hell that means uh, these days. Um, I hate to say it, the, the only place I would uh, be willing to trust is uh, with this person. Now, I'm not quite sure. Is, is this a man or is this a woman? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's that's about, and, and frankly speaking, they've even said themselves that nobody, uh, in, and we're talking about like billions of dollars here, you know, serious money. Uh, you know, you got the El Salvador kind of ideas. Okay, fine. But uh, when it comes to like the serious bankers, I think the Americans still are driving the bus. So, anyway. Um, so what does that mean? Like normalized interest rates. Uh, I like the idea of the 10-year yield working its way right back up to about 3%. So right now we're sitting at 1.5%. That means interest rates could double from here. That could easily happen. I mean, you see, if, if like we drew out, is this a head and shoulders uh, bottom? Then basically shoulder, neckline, head, neckline, shoulder. And then, of course, your trade is the breakthrough here. But this move up to here over the next few years? Sure, no problem. Is that runaway inflation? I don't know. Our bond the interest rates could double from these levels. Double. Is this more of this anecdote? You know, lumber prices going crazy, food prices going crazy. Got to try and uh, curtail the economy a little bit. Ironically enough, actually, I think it's going to go the other way around. I think you could very easily run into sort of a funny um, stagflation kind of scenario. Um, where you have rising interest rates uh, because of inflationary pressures, but the economy just sort of like muddles along. Um, and you might get like short-term shocks, you know, especially in the fall. They don't call it the fall for nothing. Usually around the Ides of March, we get shocks. What I would say is you're not going to actually even see it in the United States. I showed you this chart before. Like what I think happens to the United States of America is, um, oh darn it, where is it? Um, is this. You're going to have these short-term breaks here, right? I think this was like the, uh, the Korean War, right? You're going to get these short-term break periods. But it's not going to crash. If anything, maybe that's like the biggest sort of crash kind of scenario. I think that was when Kennedy was assassinated. Um, but not the crash, right? Not Nothing like this. So, you know, if you can find these short-term pullbacks, it's kind of... You know, I would I would say probably more Ethereum as sort of, you know, Vitalik as a, Ethereum is the world's computer, right? Kind of as a growth proxy versus something like Bitcoin. Uh, I like Bitcoin, you know, cost of production kind of idea and an excellent sort of, you know, um, value barometer. Uh, but, you know, I could see Ethereum have this kind of insane growth rate. Also, too, I think I did hear somebody talk about how Ethereum's figured out a way to reduce the supply, too. So as a result, I could really see Ethereum do very, very well going forward. Um, you know, like uh, uh, short-term shocks to the system. I have a feeling there's actually a bearish shock that's about to come up to the system. It could be one of these kind of pullback events here. Uh, I would consider it myself a buying opportunity. Um, and then, of course, you know, like I couldn't believe there was a $1.2 trillion uh, repo there just a week or so ago. So they're constantly diluting their currency. We could very easily see, 
half of this won't necessarily be actual growth. It will just be them diluting the currency. So the prices have to keep pace because, uh, you know, equity valuations are going to stay roughly the same. So anyway, crazy world. Uh, interestingly enough, I do like this kind of scenario for Ethereum <laughs> going forward. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Especially, too, the, uh, your guys' enthusiasm about NFTs. Oh, man, that's it's just hotter than hot. Um, so, I don't know. It's a tough one uh, getting too deep into the comparisons. What I'm just going to simply say is I like, you know, I like the fact that Trump uh, put a lot of sort of the rules of American doing business with the world as a bit le more level playing field. I like uh, the the demographic and the growth scenario of the U.S. Um, I like the cycle for the U.S. And I do not like the cycle for Europe. I think, if anything, Europe uh, enjoyed a artificial, uh, artificially constructed window there for people like Germany that actually I think this is going to come back and and work doubly against them now that they're in a bear cycle over in Europe um, as well too I've talked about this to you guys before when I was over in Europe there a few years ago I hate to say it but you Europeans man you really love yourselves really super super um, especially uh I like the Swiss, the French. Oh, my goodness, they love themselves. Um, well, I mean, all of you guys, you love yourselves so much. It's incredible. I wonder whether uh, maybe uh, that's uh, you got to take a little bit of that euphoria out of the out of the people's opinion. I don't know. That's that's just a personal observation. We'll see how it goes. I don't know whether that helps answer that question. Or not. It's a good question. Interesting conversation. I enjoyed con that conversation with myself. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Okay, number two. Is real estate its own asset class? Man, technically real estate's a commodity. The issue with real estate, of course, is you can develop it. And then they always say that uh, everybody's got to have a home. So what kind of real estate are you talking about? You're talking about uh, residential real estate. Everybody's got to have a home. Like in Canada, for instance, your primary residence is not subject to capital gains tax. However, if you own a second house and you flip that, well, capital gains totally up the butt. And a lot of people get really caught, you know, like uh, their cottage or something. Zips up in value, they sell their cottage, not realizing that the government looks at it like it's any other commodity asset. Um, and uh, it's subject to all commodity uh, taxes, capital gains taxes, beg your pardon. Um, okay, last BCS you spoke about dollar devaluation affecting current prices, the importance of commodities on real estate. The importance of commodities on real estate. Real estate stocks likely being used as collateral by banks to hold everything together. Ooh, wow, there's a couple big statements here. Um, so devalue, if they devalue the currency and the land stays the same value, then by definition, the price of the land in the marketplace should go up. It has no choice if everything stays the same. And the rule about this, a great example of this was Greece. You were never, ever, ever supposed to buy Greek paper because the Greek government always floats way too much paper. They can't pay their debts. They have to devalue their currency. They roll it back like 10 for one. About every 10, 15 years, they did it like clockwork. Then the Euro comes along and that's the part of the conversation from question one that I was making reference to, the pigs nations. So histor historically, if you were a Greek national, where did you put your money? Especially, you know, if you were rich, where did you put your money? You bought land. Because then that way, if they devalue the currency, it doesn't matter. The land doesn't change value. It just goes up in price commiserately. Uh, the importance of commodities on real estate. Not quite sure I understand what that means. Real estate stocks likely being used as collateral by the banks to hold everything together. Uh, maybe. Um, 
But be careful here. Uh, maybe you were thinking about my uh, conversation about how a lot of, like it's very popular in my country, Canada, to do a reverse mortgage. So a lot of baby boomers, they uh, worked a lot of years, paid off the mortgage, and then in their retirement, they've done what's called a reverse mortgage where they just keep taking money out, taking money out, taking money out, and then when they die, the bank gets the asset. Um, so there is that, and so as a result, the banks don't want to see the real estate prices fall so that the baby boomers die and they get an asset that's worth less than what they went into the reverse mortgage deal on. So I think that to a certain degree, one reason why you're seeing the reflation of the economy versus a deflation of the economy, i.e. quantitative easing, all that shit, is because the banks own a lot of this paper and they don't want to take a loss on this stuff. If the public owned all of this, then the banks would be like, fuck them, let the market collapse. And I think that the banks right now are trying desperately to get the public as long as possible. Get them to buy, get them to take out mortgages, right? Borrow, borrow, borrow. Let's, let's destroy these economies so that all these small businesses go out of business or if they have the audacity to stay in business, they are gonna have to borrow a lot of money and basically be up to their eyeballs in debt just to keep afloat. Is this sickness playing into that plan? Is the sickness part of the plan? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Point here is that I believe that the banks are long a lot. Uh, I believe that the public is also fairly cash rich with all these stimmies. And the process of getting the public to buy the top of the market here is underway. How long this lasts? This might last a good five, ten years. Tough to say. Um, it, it, this might, you know, like uh, our scenarios of what the uh, Dow looked like coming out of the Great Depression. I could easily see this scenario go on for like 10, 20 years here. And remember, interest rates are, you know, at the low part of their cycle. So it's not like we have to worry about a huge, like, double-digit interest rates. Uh, all through this period, interest rates were very low. I think I showed you that long-term interest rate chart. But once we get into this period here, right, this is where interest rates start to go absolutely insane. And, uh, you know, this will be the end of this coming greed cycle. This will be like 2035 through 2040, 2045, and probably coming out of this will be like 2050, 2055, that kind of thing. That's forever away. Long, long time. Um, uh, okay, so real estate agents, collateral, and supply shortage. Yeah, silent generation, baby boomers, millennials, all wanting their own places. And unfortunately, you know, places like Vancouver, British Columbia. You know, most of my country, it's not really inhabitable in the wintertime. I mean, I'm serious. It's freaking cold. So the lower mainland, we've got, and then to add insult to injury, they've basically opened the floodgates when the baby boomers were still in their peak earnings years and not retiring in mass. They opened the floodgates to immigration, and that trend's been going on for 10, 20 years now. So not only do we have the silent generation staying in their houses and, you know, having home-based services so that they can stay in their houses till they're like 100. Uh, we have the baby boomer generation in retirement now, home services, same thing, reverse mortgages. And then we have the millennials all coming in and then to add insult to injury, let's throw in a whole bunch of immigration as well. And so put it all together. And it's a disaster for anybody who was actually born and raised in my country. It's an absolute, utter, and complete insult what our my country is doing to our citizens. The people who were actually born here, 
20, 30 years ago, the country is completely different. And we had absolutely no say in any of this whatsoever. It's very, it's pathetic is what it is. But anyway, that's what it is. So uh, what do you got here? Bankers line, long trying to drive the boat as they loans out to everyone and inflating prices. Real estate has never looked so complicated to me. Thank you. Uh, I would say probably the entire landscape looks similar about 100 years ago when they sort of left the, uh, the British pound as the world hegemony currency and, um, and we switched to the U.S. dollar. I would say uh, prior to that, um, when the French uh, franc was uh, supreme, um, and uh, and the Napoleonic Wars changed that. Uh, you probably had a very similar situation around financial assets, and we can go back in history about once every hundred years. You have to go through this, and it's you know it's probably one of these things that you know it's a convenient coincidence that the average lifespan of the human is about eighty years or so. So as a result, we don't really live through more than one of these in any one of our lifetimes. Um, with the longer lifespan, it might be interesting to see that, you know, as time goes by, maybe the banksters have to change it to once every 150 years or so, because too many people are remembering. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, is this an easy environment to figure out? No, not at all. Um, uh, is this, you know, is this uh, environment fraught with traps? Absolutely. So all I'm going to say is, um, you know, build your plan. Identify three or four things that you know when they happen. Uh, the odds of, of whatever it is you want to see, uh, you know, going up or down for that matter. Um when you see those three or four things happen, you have a pretty damn good idea that something's going to move in your favor. Um, that that's, takes all of the rhetoric about our, our society. It takes all the political crap out of the equation. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we always say just don't take too much risk on any one single trade idea. Um, if you can follow those two simple principles... Then all of like politics, uh, mass media messages, all of that stuff, it all becomes meaningless. It all becomes completely irrelevant. You know, uh, it's don't get me wrong. It sucks when you have to live through an inflationary period. But if the inflation is indeed going on, we should be able to outpace the inflation. So, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, I mean, a great example is, um, uh, you know, at TRI, we came in and uh, we loaded up the boat uh, down here at like, uh, what, I think it was like 30 cents or something on this crazy stock. So, you know, uh, we bitch and complain about housing prices have doubled, but we should be able to get lots of these kind of trades off where you make like, you know, five, 10 times your money. Uh, and you kind of need this inflationary environment to get these kind of trades off. This can't, this won't happen in a deflationary environment. I can tell you that, absolutely. So uh, ironically enough, the problem here now is, as you can kind of see up here, you know, us sort of buy low, sell high kind of people, we're sitting here going, okay, just can we have the break so this thing comes back down to the bottom and then we can start accumulating again for the next cycle. And that's, I think, a big part of where we are right now. So we're just waiting for that break where these kind of things, they come back down to earth and we can play the whole damn game all over again. And it, really right now, it's just a question of it's a waiting game. The only problem here is, is this the end of the move? Is that it? Do I really want to get into the business of predicting that that's the end of the move? And the answer there is no, because I can tell you, man, 
Very few people are very are, are any good at predicting. What I want to do, you know, and this is basically what I did the whole damn way up, is don't have an opinion, but, you know, just every time the damn thing doubles, just let them have a little bit more. And just, you know, next sell order sitting up here, and yeah, if this is an A, B, C, D, and they're taking it up here, 70, then the next one is uh, 140, right? And you just keep working your business and working your book. Uh, would I? What would I like? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I don't have much of the original left from 30 cents. This was 100X. So, you know, if we can get a move all the way back down here and I'll start thinking about reloading <laughs> down here. Uh, that's what I would ideally love to do. But you guys don't want that because then that means that assets are going down. Hey, where am I going to buy my Lambos? So I can sit here on what I have left. And it's the same thing with Bitcoin. I think I told you all, all of you guys, um, if Bitcoin does moon here, uh, I'll be more than happy um, you know, I need to buy a house for my son. I'll be more than happy. Uh, my rule is uh, we start liquidating uh, Liam's uh, Bitcoins to buy his house above 200 G's. So you guys want to pump this thing, you know, that uh, euphoria. What was it? Sedona euphoria from back in the spring on Doge. You want to pump this thing? Hey, you, well, I'll make you a deal now. You want to pump it above 200 G's? Give Liam his fills so we can go buy his house, and I will call. I will uh, change my name to uh, Euphoria Sidonia. <laughs> yeah, that's fine by me, and I'll retire from public spotlight. I don't need to do any of this anymore. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess just the point that I would make here is um, it, it it's. Um, we're in that transition window from, you know, what does the baby boomers life look like to what does the millennials life and generation look like? This is a tricky one. I think it's important to acknowledge that the banks, uh, as long as they have easy free money policy, you don't have to worry about prices crapping out. As soon as you start hearing about the Fed having... And the Canadians, for instance, they've said that they're going to start raising interest rates uh, probably the for end of the, well, probably somewhere around the end of the spring of 2022. Um, so that's not now, right? That, that's like six, eight months from now between then and, and now and then. Could we have a bit more craziness with this sickness and then sort of hold off on cranking rates up? I think so. And I also think that in the end of the year, there's going to be some crazy ass shock here that's uh, going to validate people like Willy Woo's kind of thinking. And uh, the uh, the on-chain people, what, is it, what do they call that? Uh, glass node, I think that's what they call it. So. Uh, stra and I even put tweets out. I'm like, strap on your seatbelts, folks. This is going to get crazy. Okay, number three. Does Brian model of coin outstanding still hold? For example, considering ADA's coin outstanding and their historic inability to deliver applications, I look at it and think that while it may be useful for short-term trading, it is not appropriate for long-term investing. Um, okay, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I watched somebody last cycle load up on ADA as it was all up and toppy and uh, and they had to go through the entire process of watching it come all the way back down to nothing. You know, really the easiest way to understand what sort of value is technically is think about weekly Ws. I think we'd tell you that. Um, next week in particular, I think it's your introduction to technical analysis and uh, market structure messages, Ms and Ws. So uh, you'll be seeing that more, but I often tell people the easiest way for you to try and figure out what value is on your name is hunt those weekly W's. So, you know, pull up, uh, add a chart here. Where the hell's a weekly W? And you can do the same on Bitcoin. It's not rocket science. Uh-oh. Uh I mean, it, this looks like a fantastically successful story, but uh, it looks to me like uh, the W is down here. Yeah, right there, right? And I, I don't know. I mean, this doesn't have that much data. So. 
Dada, ada. Doesn't much have ada. Doesn't have much data. Arr. Coinbase, how old's that one? Oh, that's nothing. Blue. Eh, I mean, I suppose you could call that a W. I don't know whether I'd really like that or not, though. Uh, where's some old data? I want something that's got been around a while, for Pete's sake. Uh, I just don't know which one to use. It's one thing I don't like about these things is they just don't have that much data. This one might have a bit of data. Hey, there we go. That's better. All right. Yeah, there you go. So where's the weekly W? I hate to say it. I mean, yeah, they even pulled a monster FU down in here, eh? Oh, broke people's hearts. So that's actually not a good sign unto itself. This is not a very stable bottom, you know. This uh, this is actually suggesting that at some point we got to actually trade to new lows. Like that. So, I mean, I don't know. Does it actually go negative? 0 0.002. I mean, how many 0 0.000s do you have? And I remember the last cycle. I mean, you don't even see it here, but I remember the last cycle. I looked at tons of names that looked like this, and sure enough, they all came right back down. You know, like that damn Verge. Everybody thought Verge was, you know, next best thing since sliced bread. Uh, that can't be it. Uh, yeah. I hate how they just sort of decide, well, the old data is not that important anymore. Let's see this one. There we go. So you could argue that that ADA looks something like uh, where this thing is there, right? Say, no way this thing is ever going to come down, Brian. Never going to come down. Oh, shit. You know? And, oh Jesus! They just keep breaking our hearts. Oh, it just never ends. Oh God! Look at that. Even lower. How painful. And then finally, they put in some sort of bottom. So don't kid yourself. This shit happens all the time. Um. So, um. Uh, Fundamental value on all of these, I think, is extremely difficult to figure out. Extremely difficult. While we're in a bull trend and the market's moving up, people are going to quote you these APYs. <sighs> and uh, percentage interest based on either the current price and then you actually see that the price is moving up. So, hey, it's an even better yield. And it just becomes this circle jerk where, hey, it's awesome, it's awesome, and it never gets worse, and it's always better and better and better and better. And then one day, the damn market stops going up, and it starts going down, and it'll go down for the next two or three years. Uh, you saw that 2013-14 uh, cycle? I think we are basically in the last six months of this three- or four-year cycle. So... You want to participate in the market through this last six months of this cycle? Just could be understanding that, you know, a year from now, you might see prices all substantially lower than where we are now. Would not surprise me one bloody bit. But at the same time, too, could we moon between now and the end of the year or maybe January, February? Absolutely. Is this an easy time to go and no-brainer uh, buy good value? Nope, don't think so at all. In fact, actually, I would say this is probably a really low probability time to make really good investments. Probably a really great time for short-term uh, you know, swing trades. Uh, people who can play momentum, who understand what they're looking for, you should be able to make a fortune here over the next three or four months. People that are investing, and I know what's going to happen here, people are going to come in, they're going to buy their Bitcoins, then they're going to migrate over to altcoins, they're going to buy their altcoins, uh, thinking that, well, my, you know, this, uh, in fact, actually, the real estate girl even said it herself, you know, Bitcoin's 40,000, look at, and we even, uh, the name I came up with her was, I said, uh, okay, so here's your altcoin, Zitcoin. <laughs> And it's 40 bucks, and you're looking at it there going, 
Well, why why can't Zitcoin go to forty thousand? All right, let's buy Zitcoin. We're gonna get rich. <laughs> That's how the trap works. And then Zitcoin goes down to uh, five cents, or not even like five sats. So if you look at it in your original Bitcoin investment, it's even much worse situation because Bitcoin then falls from 40, 50,000 back down to five, 10,000 cost of production, and you're basically run out of the market. That's pretty much it, crystal ball. That's what I think is gonna happen here over the next couple of years. So, you know, uh, I considering you are level one, you're asking these questions, this is actually gonna be an incredibly difficult time for you because you're gonna learn how to do this and what you should learn is, um, and actually, you know, even just our com my comment there earlier about Doge, probably a good example. Uh, you know, our rule about Doge was Doge is a buy um, at or below uh, 40 sats. So actually, if we look at it versus BTC. Is that a combination of Bitcoin going down? Is it a combination of uh, of um, Doge going down? I don't know. But the rule is Doge is a buy at or below 40 cents. Where is that? That's uh, there. <laughs> that sucks. That looks terrible. <laughs> Uh, so I it is not something I can endorse. I can't even suggest. Hey, it looks to me like even now now they might take this motherfucker up to new highs. You don't know, but it looks to me like this thing even now is ten times what I should be paying for this thing. It's brutal, 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 brutal. If anything, what I need for you to do is I need for you to find those ideas that look more like, um, and even this one, I yeah, kind of suspect, but this one definitely, that looks like this. That just, you know, remember I said earlier, weekly Ws. What happens if we change that to a weekly W? All right? Can you see the W? Down, up, down, up, down, breakout. That's, that to me is a much, it's a little bit late here. I mean, it's not, yeah, I mean, maybe throw in a bit if you want, I don't know. But to me, something like that's a little bit safer than going in and buying something like Allen. It's just uh, sad, but uh, man, I sure love the look of this thing. I'm going to make a fortune on that, so that's good. <laughs> so that's good. That's a good thing. Okay, let's uh, keep moving forward here. Um... Hi, Brian. Can you please talk about the Benkoff check for the uh, BTC USD WMENS on 1217 uh, top? Thanks. Ahmed. Oh, boy, there's a mouthful. 121717 top. Hmm. <sighs> I don't know what that is. Hmm. Not quite sure what that is. W M Women's? What do you think he was going for? It's twelve seventeen seventeen. Maybe that's that uh M two. Oh, I must be going for that thing there. So there's that. And twelve seventeen. Boosh. Twelve seventeen. Boosh. <laughs> All right. Wyckoff check. Do you see a Wyckoff check there? I don't see one. Wyckoff check would be this here. We have this big M. We broke down. Boom. 
through that level and this right here check that is a Wyckoff check and we're still a bear down we go I would say you see up down up broke down pulled back rallied there's a Wyckoff check so 12, 17, 17, no, I do not see Wyckoff check here. So hopefully that helps you. Uh, basically for all sentiment indicators, which you've been thinking to do the opposite. They tell us what the herd is thinking. Bullish bears, so we think the opposite. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, some are going to, I mean, it's case by case. So, uh, um, these are uh, crypto uh, sentiment indicators. Things like the spread between futures, uh, and really these are forwards contracts and the spot market. Um, if I get a W here, that's actually bullish. So that's a little bit different. Actually, this is the tether uh, print. W is here. These are the, uh, the the spreads. So these sentiment indicators, they're coincidental. Ws are bullish. Um, Ms are bearish. Uh, if we go over to the stock market uh, here. We have things like uh, new 52-week highs, new 52-week lows. So that's new highs versus new lows. Obviously, W's uh, more stocks making new highs. That's bullish. Uh, M's more stocks making new lows. That's bearish. So that's different. Uh, percentage of stocks above their VWAPs. Well, again, this would be like uh, W's would be bullish. M's would be bearish. Really, these are more sort of extreme readings, right? If we have a reading way up top here, okay, well, maybe we got to cool our jets. So in a weird sort of way, that is contrarian. Uh, things like advanced decline line, same thing. You know, if we have M's uh, in advanced decline line, that's bearish. Something like the put-call ratio, though. That's the exact opposite. So put-call ratio, this is... Uh, this will peak when uh, the public is panic buying put options. So you see right there, big old peak uh, in July. I don't know whether there was a big stock market correction. It looks like there was a little bit of a peak there at the end of September as well. So W's in here are like, uh oh, be right, get ready. Uh, this would be the exact opposite. W's in here. We think bearish the stock market. M's in here, we think bullish the stock market. So that's contrarian. So, and then, you know, VIX is the same sort of thing as put call. It's going to be inverted. So same thing here. Uh, you know, uh, bottoms, W's here. That's going to be bearish uh, for stock market. M's up here, M tops. That's going to be bullish for the stock market. So there's some yes, some no. I think it's probably more case by case by case than just making the general uh, statement that they're just always opposite. No, it's not true. It's, it's case by case by case. And, you know, really my suggestion for you is uh, if you are curious, you come in the lounge, especially if you see that I'm around and you just ask me, you know, Brian, what, uh, what, is this one of the opposite ones or is this a normal one? And we can put together the list for you and make a nice little matrix for you. So I hope that helps. Uh, is there a FinViz type tool for industries and sectors that list benchmark financial ratios? Yeah, not really. Uh, I think I uh, told you in the lectures about uh, the dot-con boom and how uh, prices just kept going up and up and up. And the only way that they could justify uh, uh, the public continuing to buy and for these analysts to actually keep their jobs was they had to change the fundamental metric uh, metrics that they were using to justify the current prices. So the answer is no. What ends up happening is um, 
the um, the street has to adjust the sales pitch based on the numbers. What we have to do, of course, as seasoned investors, is have discipline and say, "Look at, I know you uh, you uh, love your EBITDA, and you're not too concerned about the fact that the company's not actually making any money right now because you think growth is endless." But I do have to concern myself about earnings. I have to use classic benchmarks. Or, you know, like in a commodity scenario, and really Bitcoin's the same thing right now, there are going to be lots of people, especially if we start going 100, 200,000 on Bitcoin, there are going to be lots of people that are going to say cost of production doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, actually, that's an old metric. That's that metric that that Beamish guy uses, and he's a loser. <laughs> I can hear it now. <laughs> so the point being that people end up changing their metrics uh, that they use to analyze things based on current market conditions. Um, so the the issue there is you have to understand what... Uh, it is that you're measuring and you have to somehow have patience and discipline not to get too sucked up into markets that you understand are overvalued. I can only bark about cost of production so much. I can only do it. Um, so, I mean, it, it. the rest is up to you. You either listen to me or you don't. That's fine. Uh, so, I mean, it would be really cool. And actually there are, you know, like what, what a lot of sites will do is they will uh, list uh, a number of different industry participants and then they will average all of the industry participants to get an idea of what the street is sort of giving that particular sector at any given point in time. And then you can compare your fundamental metrics to the industry sort of norms. So what I would suggest you do is, uh, uh, you know, I, I like the direction that you're heading. The problem here is that there aren't like, you know, like, especially the, the I, I talked to you about the 40-year interest rate cycle. So hopefully you understand, you know, now, and you guys are all living through it, that we're going through basically an 80-year pivot. Uh, so the valuations based on the cost of money right now are going to be very, very different than the valuations that they gave assets based on the cost of money in, say, 1985. So... Again, it's a function of where are we on these long-term cycles. It would be a great resource to have. But my suggestion for you is rather than look for hard and fast numbers that the market has to respect, I would sort of say, what is the industry sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, sure. In fact, you should be able to, it should be in the class. Yeah, these uh, up here, this, these, this one, this should be available in the class. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, I'll just post that in the lounge. All right, there's your level one room. Boom. But I think we should be able to give that in the class. And if not, uh, Grim uh, should be able to give you like a breakdown list of all the, uh, of all the different things in there. You're a level twoer. All right. So uh, where's level two? There's level two. There. Take that. Boom. <laughs> and uh, Kiran. Kiran should be even better at this. <laughs> so just PM me. Uh, ask me in the daily brief tomorrow because I'm kind of running out of time here. I got to get moving. Um, okay. So uh, number seven. Regarding Q number four. Hi, Brian. I meant the Benkoff check. By the way, on 12, 17, 17 top. Uh, what? 
Ben Goff checked for Bitcoin Mesh on Tennessee. From the June 22nd, 2021 low. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, do you consider Michael Saylor a smart money? Thanks. Um, do I consider Michael Saylor as smart money? Uh, yeah, he's a character, isn't he? Um, the thing with him is that his fund went parabolic straight up into the dot-com boom. And I think his asset is doing exactly the same thing this cycle, too. So, do you consider him the smart money? Um, I want to show you the chart. So, was he the smart money during the dot-com boom when his fund did this? Woohoo! And then came right back down to the bottom. Was he smart money then? If you bought into his fund anywhere along here, how did you feel over here? I don't know. I think he's uh, he's the type of guy that he goes balls deep. And as long as the trend continues, the asset's going to go crazy to the upside. As soon as the trend reverses, it could turn into an absolute disaster. So also, too, uh, notice there's a big old hole on the charts here. This gap goes all the way up to $2,200 US. So where are we? We hit 1300 So ironically enough, this thing could just, it could, you know, what? Even here, 600 what, what did we say? 2200 That's what, 3x? 4x? 2x off of the highs? I could very easily see his fund go up and fill in this gap, right? And ironically enough, everything that we do, reload zones, all that kind of stuff. But to say that he is Bitcoin smart money? That's a tough one. I would say he's like an insider of MSTR. I definitely say that. If he thinks that his asset is going, his stock is going to go up and fill in the gap as any sort of technical analyst looking at his stock would think here, at some point this gap has to be filled in. You want to know how often these gaps get filled in? Ask uh, Sharktoshi. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to remind you. So, and does he figure it is Bitcoin that actually is going to get his stock to quadruple from these levels to fill in that gap? Maybe. Is he Bitcoin smart money? I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't think he's actually directly involved in the Bitcoin story. Uh, I think he runs his fund, but I don't know whether he... Uh, what worries me about Mr. Saylor is he's picking fights with people that's really, really dangerous. I don't know how to answer that, to be honest with you. I mean, I think he's a fanboy, no doubt about it. Does that mean, I mean, does the, do insiders, uh, was it was there insiders long? Uh, I mean, think of it this way. Uh, does it make any difference? <laughs> Was uh, Bill Gates an insider of Microsoft uh, through the uh, 2000 dot com boom and the subsequent bust? Yeah. Was Microsoft a fanboy of uh, Microsoft stock or was Bill Gates a fanboy of Microsoft stock through a year? Yeah. Was he an insider? I would suppose so. Was he smart money? I think so. Did that translate that if you just bought the stock, you were guaranteed to make money? No. So I, you know, I don't know how I'd answer that. In fact, actually, you can see. I mean, this was torturous. So, sure, maybe sailors smart money, but I don't. I don't really like his attitude, the way that he approaches uh, investing. 
And frankly speaking, anybody looking at the actual stock itself right now, you got no business, quote unquote, investing your life savings in this. No, are you kidding me? That, that's just fucking stupid. Uh, you want to invest. Remember what, what did I say earlier? And I want to see everybody on the YouTube page answer this. What did I say you have to look for to justify an investment? If you're going to look at a price chart, anybody, answer me. See if any of you were listening to me. It was probably about an hour or two ago. All right? But I actually make it even easier than that, Bill. And you're level one, so you'll learn this next week. Thank you. Nicely said, Andre. <laughs> Win the booby prize. Nice, Bill. Can you see the weekly W's on this chart? Are the weekly W's here? No. Are the weekly W's down here? Look at that. What is that? Can you see this? This is why you're watching this stupid video. You have to learn how to see this. Simple as that. So does it make sense to come in? I don't know whether he's smart money or not, but does it even make sense as a good trader to come in here and invest your money? Hello, Tomo. So, I don't know. How do you answer that question? Uh, all right, number eight. In this week's week three fundamentally thinking lecture part three video, you went over a Bitcoin fundamentals doc that touches on TPS trend. <coughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> does uh, does this still exist, or could you point us to a resource for this? Thank you. Uh, transactions per section, eh? What's uh? And actually, I, I was hurting people on. I've been hearing people talk about uh, transaction per second. Like if we go um, uh, Western Union. Uh, so 1.7 million transactions are about 19 uh, per second. So then we go. Uh, so somebody remember that, right? 19, right? Oh, this is interesting worldwide. So, uh, and isn't that interesting? In 2017, man, they have really fallen off, eh? So they were 32 uh, transactions per second. So, and I, you know, I think Western Union's lunch has been eaten by things like Bitcoin. So there's two references. Old uh, top for Western Union was 32. Now about 19. So it's almost fallen in half. We go like Visa. Visa right now, uh, they're doing 1,700 transactions per second. <laughs> See the difference? <laughs> All right. And now uh, we'll take a look at, uh, at good old corn. And right now, where are we? Transaction per second. Anyway, does somebody have a number for us? Uh, people are saying, don't use this, you losers. Uh, so right now they're saying seven transactions per second. Wow, that's pretty slow. Uh, this roughly translates to five to six transactions per second. So I don't know uh, where we are um, on this. If I understand correctly, uh, there are other chains that are built on top of uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and stuff that are doing bazillions and gazillions of transaction per second. And if I'm not mistaken, I remember one guy I used to uh, sort of work with in this space, he used to always say that Cripple was by far a better remittance uh, vehicle. Like, uh, and I don't even know if uh, Cripple's even still around. You don't even hear anybody talk about it anymore. 
Uh, but uh, this thing, I think, yeah. So uh, here you are. XRP is doing uh, 1,500 transactions per second. Uh, it once got above 4,500 transactions per second. They can scale all the way to 50,000 transactions per second. So, <coughs> uh, I think this definitely still is part of the, uh, the equation. I don't know whether Bitcoin itself is going to uh, be able to replicate something like a Visa or even a Cripple, which I think are highly, highly centralized. Um, um, blockchains. So as a result, you can move a lot of transactions very quickly. There's a, you know, if anything, this would be a better conversation to have uh, with uh, Wednesday, uh, and and we we pick this apart with uh, with the boys uh, versus me just talking out my ass. So maybe even ask this question again on Wednesday. Do I have that old document lying around? You know, it would be around here somewhere. Uh, I know in our screeners, fundamental screeners. I know I did uh, one of these. There's an altcoin scoring model. I think that was a Da Vinci's old one. But uh, we did have a bunch of those kind of things lying around. I don't know. I haven't really done too much new work on that document. Be interesting to actually plot the comparisons and the growth rates and see how that's uh, developed over time. And what I might suggest, like I said before, is I don't know whether Bitcoin would really be the best thing to replicate a visa. I think uh, there are better solutions out there. So. All right, what time is it? Yeah, I gotta get out of here, guys. So, uh, so Ripple Labs has 500 employees. Yeah, so they got a lot of people working away, huh? So 500 people, one transaction each per second. So it makes sense. <laughs> no. Arr, arr, arr. They don't do it by hand, do they? Is that how these ledgers work? Somebody has to write this stuff down? Where the hell did that question sheet go? Oh, did I close it? Oh, maybe I did it over here. Yeah, there it is. Uh, all right. Uh, and, you know, feel free to bug me tomorrow in the daily brief. We can do follow up if I didn't get to everything here. Uh, you know, we in fact, you know, let's talk tomorrow on the daily brief. See if we can talk some more about that transaction per second stuff. OK, if this is not an appropriate place to ask the Canadian content only question. Let me know what is a flow through financing and how does one participate? Do you go through all the same fundamental screener technical analysis steps to shortlist an opportunity? Um, so flow through shares, uh, Canadian companies uh, in the uh, film and entertainment industry, in the biotech industry and in the mining industry and in the forestry industry. If they do any work on a deemed Canadian asset, like in the mining industry, obviously if the property is in Canada, then it is Canadian asset, then they can get a tax credit for the work that they do. Um, the only problem is these companies don't earn any money. So what good is a tax credit? So what they do is they flow the tax credit through to investors through the form of what they call flow through share financings. Good part about these is that because it is a taxable event, government's not going to give away money for free. So they go to great lengths to make damn sure that the flow through financing is priced at what the asset is really worth. And the math, you know, whoever asked this question, uh, the math is, um, I guess that's down here. Um, the math is just simply uh, two thirds the value. So you got like a 33% tax credit. So if the financing was done at uh, 10 cents, then the value of the asset itself 
is probably like uh, 66 cents or, you know, 6.6 .6 cents. Uh, pretty easy. The only problem with these financings nowadays is they're primarily held for what are called accredited investors. So you're going to have to call up uh, your brokerage uh, office um, and you have to pass the accredited investor test. Uh, every country is different. I'll leave you to figure out what whatever hurdles there are that you have to pass for that. If you pass the hurdles, great, you can participate. If you can't, you can't. Simple as that. Uh, you could also call up the company. If you can't get a satisfaction through a broker, you could call up the company directly and ask them if uh, you can participate directly with the company. They're called non-brokered private placements. Sometimes you can do it just straight through the company itself. Pretty straightforward, not really rocket science. I'll tell you, most times when a company's doing a flow through financing, it's not probably a deal I'm interested in because they're doing the deal to take advantage of a tax credit when that's not really what I want to get involved in. When I buy these little junior companies, I want to buy them right after they've been rolled back. The old shareholders are completely wiped out. The new directors are all granted options on the rolled back stock. Anybody who's owed money by the company says, fine, I'll take the rolled back stock in lieu of uh, you paying me back the debt. So the company now has no debt on the books. And, um, and uh, uh, like I said, the, in, the insiders, the directors, they've all got options uh, to buy the stock. Doesn't mean they have the stock, but if they have op options, then if the stock does go up, then they get compensated. Stock does nothing. It's no material impact whatsoever. So uh, roll back stock. Options to directors, shares for debt. Those are the kind of stories that I want to concentrate on when investing in uh, venture cap uh, penny stocks. Uh, whether they do have a flow through financing or not really is irrelevant to me. I might do it if I actually really wanted a tax credit, if I was owing taxes somewhere else. But if that's the case, talk to your accountant. They'll be more than happy to uh, come up with other solutions for you as well there. So. Okay, 20 after 1. I got to get out of here. Off to the boy. So I think we'll leave it at that for today. I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed. And ask me again, Dave, tomorrow. Maybe uh, even in the daily brief or whatever, I can always uh, come up with some examples of flow-throughs and stuff, and we can walk through them. I think Monday's uh, Monday we have Seward. He has his report, but then the second half of the daily brief, I can talk to about this kind of stuff. So just remind me tomorrow morning. Anybody who asks these questions, if you're watching this later on, if you have a follow up, you know, Mr. Uh, Ahmed here. I don't think I actually answered your question correctly. So bug me again tomorrow on the uh, in the uh, this question here. I don't know whether that's you who asked that or whoever did. Yeah. I don't think I quite understand what it is you're asking. So just ask me again in the daily brief tomorrow while I still have some more time. So, Okay, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed the frivolity. We'll probably try and do a show on Wednesday to talk specifically uh, altcoins and crypto. Uh, thank you. Very good. So uh, everybody wish me luck with Liam. My number one job in life is to make Liam have a totally awesome afternoon. So uh, that's where I go to now. And, uh, and uh, uh, your best wishes always uh, make, uh, for some reason, it really does make a big difference. So uh, all of you think positive thoughts uh, for Liam, and let's uh, give him an awesome rest of his day here today. All right. Have yourselves a great day. PMA for the win. Hope you enjoyed the rants. All the best. And the only thing left for Brian to say at this point is bye for now.